Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, welcome to The Tom Woods Show. It is episode 2421, the Thanksgiving episode. So happy Thanksgiving to everybody who is watching this on the day of Thanksgiving. I'm very pleased to be spending Thanksgiving Day with Gene Epstein recording this episode for you. Now, obviously, you know we are not recording this on Thanksgiving Day, but in but we're recording it with Thanksgiving in mind because mm-hmm. we are going to give thanks today for a bunch of things, mm-hmm. especially because we have good reason to gripe and complain. I don't criticize us for griping and complaining. We have good reason to do it. But we also have things to be thankful about. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Just like when you were in the third grade and the teacher would ask you, what are you thankful for? In fact, we just, Gene, we just discovered we were going through the garage. We're doing a super systematic clean of the whole house. Mm-hmm. We went through the garage. We found some old keepsakes from the kids. And one of them was a placemat that Elizabeth made. She was very, very, very young. And she put in there all the things she was thankful for on Thanksgiving. And so it was her family and things like that. And for some reason, she had put pencils. And I thought, you know, good for her that she appreciates the simple things in life. Although little does she know at that age just how complicated that pencil is, right? I know, yeah. That's right. <laughs> the father pounced and said, do you know, dear, that nobody knows no. how to make a pencil? <laughs> make That's a pencil. What we live, we live. Anyway. <laughs> so implicitly, she's thankful for the market economy and the division of labor. So, yeah. Gene, um, <laughs> every, first of all, for everybody, anybody who doesn't know this, um, well, first of all, I should introduce Gene Epstein as my guest. Oh, yeah, Sorry, yeah, Gene. Okay, sure. So Gene is the director of the Soho Forum, thesohoforum.org. It is the great libertarian debate series. It, it covers issues of interest to libertarians. Not all the debaters are libertarians. That makes it interesting. And uh, Gene's been doing this for quite some time. It's always, always interesting and engaging. I'm very happy to be a supporter of the Soho Forum. Before yeah. that, Gene has a, a list of accomplishments, you know, as long as his arm. And he was... He was uh, economics and book review editor at Barron's for a long time. Many, many, many credentials. And, uh, and, and I, I want everybody to understand, if you haven't seen Gene on the show before, we start with a little bit of banter. Okay, that's just, it just cannot be avoided. You cannot excise right. it from, you know, you're going to tell a bird not to fly. You know, so if you don't like the banter, you just fast forward a little bit and we'll get right into the meat of things. So Gene, what have you got for me today? Well, uh, first, Tom... Uh, uh, I, I I counted that I've been on your show literally uh, over the years, forty seven times. But this is my debut on the Tom Woods television show. Uh, I've always t- told you, Tom, that those handsome features of yours put you off to uh, the, the, our great advantage, and probably your uh, your viewership has taken off because not everybody knew just from the stills. How handsome and animated a uh, looking a guy you are, and I'm <laughs> Thank honored you, Gene. to be participating in this as well. Uh, I, uh, I uh, for you viewers, Tom threw me a curve, and he said, uh, "What do you got to be thankful for?" And uh, I, uh, I realized that even in these dark times, there are things to be thankful for. I wrote down a number of things on these note cards that I've had here. Uh, but I, I, I want to work in my own advertisement for the Soul Forum in a thankful way. Uh, I'm thankful for the fact that uh, the next Soul Forum will be a Sunday matinee on December 17th. And there, one of my two debaters, it's always one against one, will be Jay Bhattacharya. And uh, most of these, all of these guests have something to do with the Tom Woods show. It's not just that Jay Bhattacharya has been a guest on the Tom Woods show a few times. Jay, by the way, is going to discuss the case he helped bring against the Biden administration. That's going to be uh, the issue that's going to be debated. Tom, I think you may have something to tell us about your special relationship to Jay Bhattacharya. I take it uh, there's one thing you could tell us, Tom, about this. I wish you don't want to tell us. Well, I think because I, I did post the book cover to Facebook yeah. the other day because I got a copy of the book. Let me, let me uh, make clear to everybody what we're talking about. I have a book coming out. It's coming out imminently. There's there's no pre-order page yet. It's all going to happen in rapid yeah. fire succession. Boom, pre-order is going to go up. You're barely going to pre-order and boom, it's going to be there. And it's called, um, what, what the heck is it called? 
I, I actually, my daughter last night, Regina, looked yeah. at it because I got the proof copy in the mail just for me to look over and it looks great. And uh, she said, did you come up with this title? Because I think, which, which was her way, I don't think she meant it this way, but kind of her way of saying, your titles are all terrible. Like you came up yeah. with this brilliant one. So, so yes, I did, as a matter of fact, come up with this title. So it's called Diary of a Psychosis. And the subtitle yeah. is How Public Health Disgraced Itself During COVID Mania. And yes. Jay Bhattacharya, our good friend from Stanford, MD, PhD, wrote the foreword for me. Very generous and kind of him to do that. And in fact, I, as I always do when I request a foreword, I wrote and said, look, Jay, I, you know, I, I, have, I understand you have a million reasons you might, want to, might not want to do this for me. I totally yeah. understand. But here's the deal. I'll pay you X dollars and if you write me X number of words. And he responded, I refuse to take one cent from you because this would That's be right. a tremendous honor for me. Yeah, well. Oh, okay, I'll well, keep the no. money. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I, I, I regard yeah, probably if pushed, there have been many great sources, many great uh, and well-informed people on the issue of the lockdowns, but probably Jay is number one in terms of his breadth of knowledge, the honesty with which he speaks. I am really impressed that he thought enough of you to want to do an introduction and associate himself with you. Jay, of course, is not just a, a, a deeply intelligent man. He's got a PhD in economics and on top of that, um, the, in, in medicine. Uh, and he is not only well-informed, he's heroic for reasons that you and I know about because very early on, he put his career on the line about this. He, he went a lot further even than you did, Tom, or than me. Um, and of course, you, we're a couple of amateurs. So uh, that is deeply impressive. Uh, I'm going to take him to, I want to take him to dinner. I want to pick his brains about so much as usual. And indeed, he is a, a devout Christian. He makes no bones about that. He and his wife are converts to Christianity. Uh, she's at, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, and he will refu he refuses to accept money from the So Forum uh, for uh, appearing. Uh, I cover his cause; he'll accept that. And uh, and so and then on top of that, I mean, you and I, of course, having a slightly nasty disposition, both of us. Jay is just excessively generous to his enemies, and it comes across sincerely. You and I don't quite have that saintliness, but it just comes to him naturally. He's an extraordinary human being. And so that's, of course, part of the reason why I invite people uh, to come, especially on December 17th for that matinee. He will be debating a law professor who has criticized uh, the case that he was instrumental in bringing and that has gone a long way toward embarrassing the Biden administration. So I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and Well, let's uh, say in parentheses what that the case has to do with free speech and That's the right. federal government's use of big tech platforms to suppress particular individuals. That's right. And, and uh, uh, thank you for, for the contrib contributing to that point, Tom. Indeed, uh, it's, it's, you might say it's out of, it, it's sort of like not Jay's wheel. Jay, of course, uh, can talk about the deep research he's done into COVID. He, he as you know, you, I guess I learned from you, was it through you? Because you had his assistant on, he's doing a podcast uh, these days. Uh, a very good podcast. I forget the name of it. And they get a, d a deep dive into the COVID issues. Oh, yeah. But Illusion David, of consensus, I think. Yeah. Illusion of consensus. Oh, that's yeah. right. Of consensus. Yeah. Right. And the point then is that, as well, is that uh, I'm pitting him uh, against a law professor on this issue. Uh, and so uh, so he's going, he, he's, he's going to be talking about legal issues. This is a law professor who's attacked uh, the case. And so in that sense, I, 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 it's going to be an interesting match uh, because uh, Jay is going to, ha I imagine he'll consult with his lawyers to help prepare for the arguments. But anyway, I'm looking forward to that. I'm very thankful that Jay is returning. This is the second time he's been at my SO forum. I'm also thankful that in late January, I'm going to have Terrence Keeley uh, defending uh, his basic ideas in, that he wrote in his classic book, The Economic Laws of Scientific Research. Uh, and uh, uh, he's got, as you know, Tom, because you had him on the show uh, 
a couple of months ago. And uh, we're thankful for the fact that Terrence no longer works for an organization that forbade him to appear on your show, Tom. And we won't mention that organization. It wasn't the ADL. Uh, they, <laughs> they, didn't, they told him not to appear on your show. Well, I and, strongly urge people to watch that episode. We did, it's an episode on, on government and science. And yeah. he is resolutely opposed to this expenditure of one public cent on scientific research, which, as I'm sure listeners will realize, runs counter to what every scientist in the world wants. <laughs> but he makes a very powerful case. I thought it was one of the best episodes I've ever done. TomWoods.com slash 2400, episode 2400. You did, no, you did a great episode. He, he, he wrote his book, The Economic Goals of Scientific Research, costs like over 70 bucks. I always say 70 bucks well spent, but but Charis is completing an updated version of the book, which he guarantees will be within the reach of the average person, yeah. not that expensive. You did indeed do a superb interview of him, but uh, of course, uh, I actually contacted him, as you know, I asked him what the heck happened, what, what happened with you and Tom Woods, he told me what happened, that he was ordered not to talk to you, but but the ban was lifted because the people who ordered him were no longer his employer. So, yeah. so uh, I, I helped with that, Tom. And indeed, Thank it was you, a Gene. great interview. But the point, though, is that especially since Terrence disagrees with a whole lot of very well-informed people, uh, I approached him to tell him, I want you to defend your views in my debate arena. And he was, of course, most gracious in making that uh, and, and telling me that he would do so, and that's in late January. Another tie-in with you is that I'm going to be doing, uh, belatedly, you might say, in February, because of my scheduling issues, a debate on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and that will feature Jeremy Hammond. Uh, Jeremy's been on, he did a debate on your show about Very recently. Ago. He's done two and, of them, but uh, very recently he did one, yeah, Israel-Palestine. I'll I, I tell you, you know, you know, the funny thing about Jeremy Hammond, which I'm thankful about, is that I, would, I, I happen to be just browsing through some Kindle thing, and I see a book that pits Ron Paul against uh, Paul Krugman. And it's, it's a Jeremy short, Hammond book. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. And, and I thought, what, oh my God, I've been writing about Krugman. You, Tom, have, are a sort of a veteran of Contra Krugman, that great show, which I still, by the way, save because a number of the episodes are still informative. And then this kid, uh, this guy I never heard of, is doing a book contrasting on the years leading up to the 0809 crisis the, what Ron Paul was saying versus what what uh, what this what Paul Krugman was saying and the difference between the two and then he's a switch hitter he's done most of his work I, recently of course on COVID and vaccine issues but he's done an enormous amount of work and and a major book on the uh, on the Israeli Palestinian crisis and in fact I contributed an introduction to that book uh, 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 um, uh, the uh, about uh, it, I've, I'm I'm not going to mention the child look up Jeremy Hammond but again. I want Jeremy to be in an arena to defend his views. That's going to be in February. So that's a tie-in with you. Another tie-in with you, Tom, is that in March, um, I'm going to be a, a, the debater. I decided I'm going to do this one. Uh, Joe Nacera, uh, who is a well-known journalist with Bethany McLean, has written a book about the COVID issue, which mostly sort of agrees with you and me, but he blames capitalism. Uh, for the lockdowns, and so that's going to be. Uh, and I I realized that I, you know you know when in doubt blame capitalism. So but are you I'm, just going to be arguing definitions with him? Because obviously he doesn't well, understand what capitalism is. Okay, Tom. I guess you're going to skip that debate. I'm only trying to tell you that I think it's well, worth. Is teaching. that your approach, Tom? Well, I you don't have to reveal your hand no, in no, advance no, of the debate. You know, it's funny. I keep. People keep telling me that you don't have to reveal. I'll reveal anything, Tom. I, 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 I want, oh, I, I won't. Mean, <laughs> I mean, if Joe, if Joe does not, wants to know my argument, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only saying that that uh, there's a difference between capitalism and capitalism. And indeed, uh, the, uh, I, I'm, only, I'm only trying to, trying to explain to people that there is such a thing as capitalism. Whenever I've debated socialists, I've had to say, this is what capitalism is. You probably know my main message is that you can have worker ownership under capitalism. The workers can own the means of production. You know, so therefore, definitions matter. 
terminology matters, and uh, it's not just uh, splitting hairs. Uh, so in a way, that will be my major approach uh, uh, because, because again, people just don't understand what capitalism is. Uh, so that's going to be my argument. Uh, so I'm, th I'm thankful for that. And I'm also thankful, Tom. Now, I guess you're going to be uh, nervous about this reveal. I'm thankful that it looks as though I've gotten Tom Woods to agree to do a solo forum debate. <laughs> well, you know, Gene, I had just I had what? just written that. I I you know, I have a program supporting listeners.com and people who support the show. And I've decided I'm just going all out uh, above and beyond for these people. So I'm gonna start sending them a print newsletter every month in the mail, like a really good, meaty print newsletter in the mail. Because nobody else in my, who who else is doing that in our circle? Nobody's sending out a, a personal newsletter. Well, that's but true, I'm doing Sean, it. But I'm doing it. So I'm hold on. So in not. that newsletter. I said to them, well, I'm just going to tell you guys, because yeah. you guys are my cream of the crop, that I'm doing the so form debate. And now I can't, now the whole world knows it. That's okay. Uh, I'll tell I, them other yeah. secrets. Don't I worry, supporters. Be, other secrets I, are coming your way into your mailbox. I've, the, the date that Tom mentioned, I, I've got scheduling, issues, but, uh, but it looks as though it's going to happen in April. Uh, I found a worthy opponent for Tom. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I, uh, and I, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I want it at the Sheen Center, uh, which is two blocks from my home, which is where I want to host the after party for Tom so that he can do book signing. And this will be in April. And, uh, I was told by whoever wrote the Sheen Center that they're optimistic that I can nail that date and, uh, uh I'll keep you informed, Tom. So, uh, my God, my soul form just makes me Deeply thankful, Tom, and again, especially thankful that the great Tom Woods is going to be a debater at the Soul Forum. Uh, I needn't. We've 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 rehashed uh, how I've moderated a debate that you did with that guy named Mister Malice. We won't go over that. Uh, but uh, this is you're returning to the ring. Uh, you're not pulling a Bobby Fisher anymore, uh, right? So now that, you can stop calling me that. I, <laughs> and and I'm not even going to define for our for for half the young people in the audience what it meant to call you Bo the Bobby Fisher debating because you're no longer the Bobby Fisher debating anyway. Okay, so so that's beyond that. But I, I want to get to the meat of some of the things I'm thankful for. Uh, and uh, so now now starts the basic assignment that I took from Tom. Even though again I'm thankful for all those people who are going to be at my debate. TheSoulForum.org. Go into TheSoulForum.org. All of the debates that I've listed, tickets are on sale. Uh, the, the, the one with Tom in April has not yet been posted because we haven't nailed the date. But all of those other ones are on sale, and I, I don't think you want to miss the December 17th. Uh, I imagine Tom, of course, has so many obligations. I think he'd love to come to the dinner with Jay and come to the December 17th, but he probably can't make it. I so can't, but I can come to the February one. But we, we should get to that. Well, I'll okay, tell you that well, off the good. air. I'll that's tell you good. that off the yeah, air. No, yeah, no, I mean, by the way, the February one on, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the venue that we use told us that those in charge of the Sheen Center, named after the great Bishop Fulton Sheen, cannot host this debate. They, they do not want to host a debate on an issue as incendiary as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I'm going to have it at the Soho Playhouse, by the way, where I think you've seen a couple of plays. The Soho Playhouse is that theater that you've got. That you, I know you saw a couple of plays. A very nice stadium theater. They will, they will host it. That's where it's going to be held on the, uh, the February debate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's depressing, uh, to think that you can't host a debate in yeah. New York City on this issue. Uh, but, uh, anyway, but, but, but look, I did get a, a decent venue for it. Uh, and uh, my only regret is I'm not going to be able to have the after party at my loft apartment. It's going to be downstairs. All right. Okay. But that, all right. Enough of my thanks to the soul forum. I, I'm going to plunge in and just say uh, about COVID, about the lockdown. Uh, obviously, uh, I am thankful, maybe even Tom is thankful, for the fact that the behavior of the teachers' unions was so abusive that they were, that Corey DeAngelis, who we've had on your show, who, who's, the, who's probably the most articulate advocate for school choice, uh, is riding high because there's been so much 
parental anger about the way the schools were kept closed, the, the, the way the teachers' unions behaved, that, uh, refer- that there's been a huge turn toward in, in the voting booth and in other ways toward uh, the charter schools. And uh, despite the fact that I had Corey DeAngelis, by the way, debate Stephen Kinsella, even though libertarians are divided on charter schools, they, they, there is an argument that Stephen Kinsella will make that it's a pact, ultimately a Faustian bargain, a pact with the devil. I, 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 I will betray one thing. I spoke with Jeff Deist, our mutual friend, who was head of the Mises Institute, and at one point he was going to host this debate on school choice, and Jeff admitted to me, just like I admitted to him, the way this, whatever issues you want to argue ideologically about what will happen to school choice, the way the teachers' unions have been routed, the the groundswell of anger among parents, the the fact that if a politician starts insulting parents about their choice of school, of, uh, the choice they make for their kids' school has, has gotten them angry is so great that that uh, we're just happy about uh, happy for, for Corey DeAngelis and we vote for him. So I'm thankful for that. Do you join me in being thankful uh, for that? For that, I I, I am. They that? they definitely what? overreached the 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 school people. They they went uh, they went berserk on on COVID. They've gone berserk on a number of other issues. And it's made a lot of people just say, "Enough's enough. Uh, we need to, we need more choices. We, we need uh, not to be tethered to this organization and the institution it represents." So that's all been great. Quick message from Old Woods here: It's Thanksgiving. It's Black Friday. It's that time of year, and I've got a great announcement for you. You know, I have a site called Liberty Classroom, and this is where you learn the history and economics and other subjects. They did not really teach you all that well, to put it mildly. As a matter of fact, think of it this way. You look at the headlines today, they're all propaganda, they're all wrong, but today's headlines become tomorrow's history. So if you don't trust the headlines, how can you trust the history? But you can trust what we teach at libertyclassroom.com because it's taught by people who don't despise you, who have terminal degrees, who have done important scholarly work, but who actually, get this, believe in freedom. So... I'm there and a whole bunch of other people I trust teaching you this stuff while you drive around in your car or when you have insomnia at three o'clock in the morning or anytime you want, you can consume course after course after course where history, economics, and related topics are taught the way they should have been taught to you in the first place. So if like me and frankly, everybody else you know, you are a victim of educational malpractice, it's never too late. My dashboard university, libertyclassroom.com, is open for business 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So check it out at libertyclassroom.com because at this time of year, we've got a super, super deep, deep discount on it. So go do that. Inform yourself. Learn that truth you know is out there, but they ain't never going to teach you. Well, we're going to teach it to you at Liberty Classroom. And this is the best time of year to get it. So head over to libertyclassroom.com and you will thank the old man here. I just made a little mention in an article I wrote the other day of Randy Weingarten, who's head of the American mm-hmm. Federation of Teachers. Yeah. Who, just, just to point out that right now there is still this mad, crazy, fact-free, irrational attack on Florida for having, quote, banned books. Uh-oh. Well, okay. There are, the, the point about that is, well, two points. One, mm-hmm. take a look at the books that have been, quote, banned, and you, you'll see why. Uh, there's, a, there's a video uh, of a guy um, going up to ordinary passersby and saying, uh, do you think books should be banned from school libraries? I said, absolutely not. He said, all right, I'd like you to read a few paragraphs from this book. And they look at it and they say, I'm not reading that. <laughs> I mean, they said, yeah, no, this book doesn't belong in a school. That doesn't mean it's banned. You can buy it anywhere you want. You know, no, no problem. But, the, but the, the other thing is they're trying to say, oh, well, it's not just that. It's also to kill a mockingbird and whatever. And none of that's true. Then none of that's true. Uh, there are oh. no state level bans. You know, maybe, who knows? Maybe some, you know, uh, uh, school board somewhere. D- but you really can't find examples of this. And mm-hmm. you can find examples of it in other states. And it's w- whatever. But in Florida... To Kill a Mockingbird is actually on the recommended list for, for the State uh, Department of Education's 
a guide to the English arts, English language mm-hmm. arts. So mm-hmm. the whole thing is phony. And you have this singer, Pink, who's been saying, well, I'm going to give away these banned books at my concerts. Well, how banned mm-hmm. can they be if you're able to give them away at your concerts? You know, you'd be hauled away if they were banned books. And again, there, the USA, USA Today said, this is phony. There is no such list of banned books in Florida. The, the Associated Press, not a big fan of Ron DeSantis, says, false. There is no such list. And Randy Weingarten, who had initially complained about the banning of books in Florida, she had to remove her tweet because even she couldn't defend that. So I'm thankful to Randy Weingarten that she finally admitted at least one error she made. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no. See, see, part of it is that you know, the, the, there's the the old ploy when you do a thanks is that you know it's like thank God for small but tiny favors. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, that's that, you just pulled that one, Tom. Yeah, um, I want to avoid. I want to say, look, you know, the the groundswell of support for school choice to be but okay, look, you know, I'll accept that, Tom. But well, you already God. did that one, so I just I just added a friendly <laughs> you amendment. You managed a grain of sand, Tom. Yes, right. That, I'm great. I'm grateful for that. No, indeed, I guess the, it is a bit of a joke, you know. I guess. I guess Guess you know you can't you you can't buy you can't buy these books on Amazon. I guess the the uh, the Santas is preventing these books from being sent, or, or you can't electronically transfer it on Kindle. You know it's a little crazy. How can you ban a book? These well, well l- l- let me say something about books and, and well, that's something I'm thankful for. Yeah. So as I mentioned, I have a book coming out this year. Yeah. And yeah. it's being published by the Libertarian Institute. By uh, uh, by, by by the great Scott Scott Horton, Scott Horton yeah. uh, on whose board I sit. By the way. Yeah. And so uh, Scott just asked me, hey, how about if the Libertarian Institute publishes your book? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, well, like, why would I want that? And so he's explaining. And I realized if the Libertarian Institute publishes my book, I don't have to shop around for a, a designer of the text, you know, like internally mm-hmm. of the book and all that. And a lot of headaches just go away if yeah. the Libertarian Institute publishes it. So I thought, yeah, 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 why not? And he said, now, look, I promise you, we're going to be efficient and quick and we're going to get this thing out and you're going to be really happy with the results. And I, I've never worked with Scott in that way. I've interviewed him on the show, but I've never worked with him. And I didn't know, like, all right, but it's like, is his editor going to know? Like, I don't want my text edited. I, I, yeah. I don't mean to sound like I'm an, I don't, like an arrogant jerk, but the text I submitted is good. I don't, I don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. But if there's, if there's a typo, we'll fix it. If there's a quotation mark in the wrong place, we'll fix it, that kind of thing. And I thought, oh, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, there have been times that I have fought with editors who were inserting errors into my text that I had to take back out. Scott's editor at the Libertarian Institute is so good. Uh, I mean, I've been around this game a long time. I've been a magazine editor. I've edited books. I've, I've compiled indexes. I've, I've done every aspect of book publishing. And he knew a lot of stuff I didn't know. Uh-huh. That, uh, for example, something as, as trivial as if you're giving somebody's height, let, let's say five feet, 10 inches, you don't use curly quotes for that. You use prime markings for that. Mm-hmm. I thought, holy cow, that's a detail I didn't know. <laughs> so Scott's operation is well-oiled. I mean, it is great. I, and I am deeply thankful to Scott, to Ben Parker, and that whole team because they they vastly exceeded my expectation. It's a small outfit, the Libertarian Institute, but it's got an infrastructure uh, that's worthy of a much, much larger, larger organization. So well, no, you, thank you to the well, Libertarian Institute. Well, no, that's wonderful to hear. I mean, I know Scott, I, I, I've, uh, I've criticized Scott for his behavior at times, even though, as I say, I preface it by saying that I think he's perhaps in the lib- among libertarian uh, lights, he's perhaps our only authentic genius. Uh, and his books are wonderful, so I always say that. Uh, but apart from that, it's just great to hear uh, what you've just said. Uh, having been a writer, as you imagine, for a weekly, where where you were always dealing with editors, uh, I basically found that they that they respected my column, and I got some good editing. So when I did a front of the book article uh, cover story, then I really had to fight. Uh, uh, perhaps the, there are lots of good quips about editors and writers. Uh, the, 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 the most aggressive quip that sticks to my mind is that Thomas Sowell, whom we both admire, I think he's a very accomplished writer, actually. He's got sort of an odd, muscular style. Uh, I, in a book he published about 30 years ago, I forget which, he wrote in the acknowledgments, 
Uh, this editor has forced me to rescind my motto that the only good editor is a dead editor. <laughs> is what he said. You, know, you finally met an editor he likes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, t- t- typical Thomas Sowell aggressive way of putting it. And indeed, so you finally met an editor. You've rescinded that. But the, yeah, well, that's great. And then the question, Tom, uh, you are producing the Audible book, Audible version, read by you. Yep. Yeah. Has that been done? Or is that oh, chance? that's done. It's just that you can't submit it to them until you have your Amazon pre-order page up. I see. And, and then, that's how they identify the book. So, I But see. the files are all done. The audio files are all done. Well, that's and, wonderful. And yeah. they're on a third-party site right now so that even if all my computer equipment got stolen, doesn't matter. That, that audio book is done and in the can. You are I, a com- you're an accomplished reader of your book. You did a great job with somebody else's book, which was called Contra Krugman. And so I'm sure you've done a great job with your own book. And, I was very pleased and with then, it. And then it has an approximate publication date all set? It, it should be November 29th. Let's keep oh, our fingers wonderful. crossed. Might okay. be a few days later than that, but not, not, not much later than that. Okay, more than enough time to make it for for the Hanukkah presents as well. Oh, as, no uh, doubt about it. Absolutely. If you've been if you've been thinking, what am I going to do for Hanukkah presents? You know, your problem is solved, my friend. Well, that's true. Again, of course, plenty of time for you, for you to have plenty of copies for book signing and sales when you do my debate at the Soul Forum in April. Yes, oh, well, that's right. That's great. Okay. Now, let me so say something else. Gonna... Let, let yes. me say, you know, because you said, uh, uh, the, I don't know if this is before we recorded or not, but that yeah. you were also, you might mention things you're thankful for that weren't necessarily in the past calendar year. And so no. as long as we're talking about editors, let me say something about that. Sure. I, I've been very critical of a number of editors that I've had. And it's not because I'm hard to work with. It's because they're terrible. Uh, I, now, I did, at Columbia University Press, I had an excellent editor. And unfortunately, she was working out of an awful style manual that, that CUP has. Mm-hmm. And so it would be things like they would want to change things to like chairperson or whatever. Like It's just awful, like hideous changes of the language to be gender neutral. Mm-hmm. And I would fight back on some of them because some of them were just... Mm-hmm crimes against the English language. And I would just, I would gently fight back because I know it's not her fault. And, mm-hmm. and I would say I got one out of three of the requests I wanted, which was better, better oh, than wow. nothing, you know, better than nothing. But I will say that when I wrote Meltdown about the 2008 financial crisis, now that book was a, that book did extremely well. But mm-hmm. when I wrote that, I was given an extremely short deadline. They told me I had three weeks to write it. I, I, yeah, again, it's unbelievable. Yeah, Those... I had three weeks to write it because they said, the problem is publishing shuts down for two weeks of Christmas, so we're going to lose that. Mm. And the whole world's going to write a book on this, and no one's ever heard of you, Tom Woods, so, except your little circles. So you got it. The only advantage you have is being the very first one. So, yeah. we, so you got to write it in three. So I came back with, well, what if I did it in five weeks? And so we, we split the difference and said, you could have, you could have a month. Mm-hmm. So I, I turned that thing around in a month. And when I submitted it, 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 was, it was that book I was the least happy with when I submitted it. I mean, because at this point, I've written yeah. 13. I was the least mm-hmm. happy because I, that's just not enough time. And I will say that the person who helped smooth it out and organize it right and, and, and even add a couple of really helpful analogies was Tim Carney, who's, who's now a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He was a godsend. I, and and I, I was dreading oh, it. Wow. I didn't want to know what the editor thought of it. I was so uh, unhappy with it. But when I saw how he helped me along, it was, it was such a relief. So my thanks to Tim Carney 15 years later, he did tremendous work for me. Well, uh, th- no, that, that's interesting. No, I, I, have, uh, I, I've been, I have never met Tim Carney, but I've encountered him in interviews and his writings. He's a very smart guy. And what an odd, uh, I, I would never have imagined that uh, he'd been involved with that project. And of course, that, that uh, to reminisce, that, uh, so to speak, thankfully, is how you and I met, Tom, because we were teamed up to, uh, to uh, indict the Fed together. Yep. And of course, that was when, when I had a lot of fun uh, startling you with my radical views. You thought I would be a libertarian light. Uh, and uh, and I was fiery, but then apart from that, you were doing book signing and sales of that book at that time, uh, uh, and it was a very well written book. Uh, and uh, uh, and of course, I almost like resented as a writer to think 
I, I wrote a book called The Kano Spinning. It took me a lot more, longer than a month. I said, my God, it, it, are you superhuman? Uh, I had Tim Carney helped, and I guess you also. I mean, still, it's just I can't believe that you were able to do it uh, in a month. Uh, I, I, but but I, ga I gather also, as you said, what helped uh, that you did that superhuman uh, achievement was that you were able to follow in the footsteps of Ron of, of a lot of the stuff that Ron Paul's people had done. Yeah, so you yeah. were yeah they they paved the they paved a lot of a lot and of it was because I had research. gone to many, many of the programs of the Mises Institute. I had yeah. read all the books. So I was yeah. ready. I yeah. was re I didn't have to learn everything from scratch. The only things I had to learn from scratch were the contingent facts of the matter. You know, like what was you know, the mortgage-backed securities and all that stuff. But the, and you know, the particular case involved. But the general principles I had down pat. So that was, that was no problem. I could quote a line from it, Tom. You wrote, everyone knew that Fannie and Freddie would be bailed out if they got into trouble. Everyone was right, you know, and as you wrote, a nice turn of phrase. And that's Thank what you. you wrote, probably in the wee house of the morning. I forgot that I, I wrote that. That's all a blur. <laughs> I, I would imagine, Tom, if I told you to turn out a book in a month uh, right now, you would say, I don't think I can do that anymore. I would tell you to go jump in a lake. Yes, I would. All right, what else you have on your list? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, no, 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 what's the other? No, no, no. Tom, let me just, you know, when you say editors, let me just finish one thing. It, we were talking, a, a number of my reporter friends were talking, we used to have a little gripe sessions at Barron's. And as one of my colleagues put it well, he said, look, for some of the editors here, they look at what you've submitted and they ask themselves, how would this be written if I had written it, uh, there are other editors who say, "How can I make this better?" Yes, that's the editor we want. You know, and yes, and the, the editors who can have, and and when you encounter, and we had some, we encounter an editor who can say, "How can I make this better?" They read it closely and they see ways of making it better. Uh, you're always grateful, uh, you know, if you have any humility. But then the rewrite people, how would it be written if I if I had written, written it? Uh, the, the intrusive people, uh, you know, then of course that gets into our old joke, you know, those who can't write, edit, those who can't edit, publish. And then we used to joke, and those who can't publish, publish barons. That was our cynical joke. Anyway, that aside, the editor, the editor, and oh, go, that's right, T.S. Eliot's joke was, the joke was most, most, edit, most editors are frustrated writers, and T.S. Eliot shot back, and so are most writers. But that aside, it's the war between writers and editors, and great editors are always important. So, but that aside, I've got a, a more cosmic one to be thankful for. Uh, I wrote it down this way. Uh, I'm happy that India and China are heavily invested in fossil fuels. Uh, I'll put it more generally and say that, not surprisingly, not surprisingly, uh, the, uh, however dumb or obnoxious uh, are the political leaders of countries like India and China. Uh, however uh, uh, crazy some of them are, uh, they're not so crazy that they don't understand that fossil fuels are the ticket out of poverty for their populations. And uh, it's really, and, and, and this is being constantly really reported grudgingly in the New York Times that that the poor countries of the world are not going along with, with with the statement of the rich countries: fossil fuels for me, but not for thee. Uh, and uh, uh, in particular, the joke is that while half the story is that China is investing a lot in windmills and solar, they're also super investing in coal-fired plants because coal is pretty much all they have as a backup for the solar and wind. So, so heavily, heavily emitting CO2 um, is coal, and they are investing heavily in coal. And it's amazing that the, uh, the climate alarmists still seem to blind themselves to this fact. Uh, and that at, at this late date, they, they, are, they can't appreciate the fact that that the poor countries of the world are going to, and China and India, of course, already account for like one third of the world's population together. Uh, that uh, that that they're not going to along with this 
utterly destructive policy, destructive in Germany, and of course, it's destructive in this country, but it's not. But the idea that that people are going to continue to burn dung or wood and die of air pollution from doing so, that they can't accept that. And so uh, all, uh, soon, pretty soon, uh, those climate alarmists are going to have to face up to that fact. Uh, you've had, I, I forget who, who you've had on your show, Tom, about this issue. It's not an issue about which, of course, I feel very strongly I've had a number of debates about it. Uh, uh, I could elaborate any special reaction to what I've just said, Tom. Well, I should, I should certainly um, return to the subject because I don't think I've talked that yeah. much. I think the only times I've really talked about it in recent episodes would be with Alex Epstein, but I, I definitely have had others on. Yeah. Um, well, I, would, I would add... I think this was a few months ago, but still in 2023. Yeah. There was a tweet, maybe you saw this, about uh, Greta Thunberg posted oh, in 2018. Greta, yeah. yeah. A tweet saying, a top climate scientist says all of humanity will be wiped out in five years if we don't stop using fossil fuels. Yeah. She waited, Gene, five years to the day and then deleted the tweet. Oh. <laughs> so so it, it wasn't going to have to say she... She couldn't be sure it wasn't going to, maybe we all of humanity was going to die the next day when it turned five years. We didn't, she got rid of the tweet. No comment, by the way, or nothing like, you know, in the future, I'll try to be a little bit more responsible with my rhetoric. I've learned something here. Uh, we're not going to make good policy on the basis of panic. It, these are the last words that will ever come out of her mouth, Gene. So I, if they ever did, I would be thankful for that. Well, that's a classic story. I, 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 I will, I, I'd like to throw in a nuance because... Yeah, there are, I probably have had most of the interesting people on your show. I don't know if you've had Stephen Coonan. I had him do a debate. I've had no, Bjorn I Lundberg. I imagine you've had Bjorn uh, yeah. on uh, as well. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, he pronounces it Epstein, uh, Alex Epstein. Uh, I think you've had him on a couple of times, and he's very good. Uh, but but Coonan, in particular, uh, in his uh, uh, book, Unsettled, uh, gives you a deep dive into the whole issue of how warming started in the uh, 1890s and how it uh, it actually was rapid from uh, 1910 to 1940 and slowed. And the point being that just on that on the surface, since uh, since carbon dioxide and industrialization didn't begin to become a factor until the 1950s, because most of the world was really you know devastated from World War II and was not rapidly industrializing. Uh, it, it, so much of the warming occurred before CO2 became a factor, and then he explains all the other factors that affect warming, and his net conclusion is that the models are muddled and that we really don't know to what extent CO2 is contributing to, to the warming trend. And then on top of that, I, as I keep reminding Steve Coonan, because he's local, he's in where you got breakfast together. I said, Steve, do you, do you recall that you analogize this to eating an extra cucumber every day and how it affects your weight? That, that, that and that, and uh, uh, why do I mention that? Because Bjorn Lumberg, who basically is a valuable resource, uh, keeps saying that man is the major contributor. And honestly, we don't even know that. Now, now, of course, with that said, just th that all that really means is that CO2 may not be the problem. If warming is the problem, as Kuning says, we have all kinds of ways of dealing with, you know, um, with, a, with a planet that's two degrees warmer. Uh, you know, the kind, uh, it was a quip from, uh, I forget the guy from MIT, who said, the kind of temperature change you barely notice from the morning to the afternoon is the problem. The point, again, is that there's a very heavy burden of proof on the alarmists. The alarmists who would try to tell us that we've got that we've got to turn back the clock to the unreliables, that we've got to deny the potential for prosperity by by the two thirds of the world that is still mired in poverty. They bear a very heavy burden of proof and they have no case to make. And so they clearly uh, most of them I guess unintentionally pushing a pretty evil doctrine. And uh, I'm happy about the fact that the, that that the leaders of these countries, India and China in particular, are really not knuckling under. Much as much as they may occasionally pay lip service to the idea or build those windmills and the rest of it and sell it to the world, uh, China is going coal. 
India, China, and Turkey uh, are buying Russian oil. Uh, they're not going along with it. And I'm happy about that, thankful about that. Uh, so, okay, so I guess we'd kiss that one off. Um, yeah, let's let's do. It. I mean, I couldn't agree one. more. I couldn't agree more, m- okay. more with that. And, and and by the way, I think it's a reflection. Even though the UN uh, obviously agrees with all the climate yeah, stuff, yeah, I think this just this flat out defiance is a reminder of the shrinking influence of the U.S. The U.S. wants them to comply with these crazy requirements, yeah, yeah. and they just don't care. Yeah, yeah, we, exactly. Uh, yeah, and 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 again and again, oddly enough. Uh, uh, you could, you know, and mu- much as I'm like, I read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal every day, uh, and uh, I uh, I learn from both. And it, of course, it always interests me. Uh, I'm going to get to the Times actually in a moment, which is interesting. The, the, the New York Times, if you read between the lines, you even read the headlines at times, they really are aware of the fact that it's not happening. Uh, just that source alone can tell you that it's not happening. The poor, the poor countries of the world are going fossil fuels big time. Uh, and I think that that's also a good thing that New York Times readers are being informed of that fact in, in case they actually want to read those articles that the Times publishes. Uh, okay, so now I want to get into something more contentious. I'm happy I was wrong. I'm happy I was wrong. And what was I wrong about? Uh, uh, I was wrong about uh, having said uh, that I was on Matt Kibbe's show like a year ago, September, and uh, I said that, look, what's inevitable, really, I said, is that 2023 is going to see a recession. Uh, I said, uh, and then, uh, and then Matt uh, came down on me and said, yeah, and you know it's going to be the, the mother of all recessions. It's going to be major. And I said, no, I don't know that. Uh, I, I said, you know, we can't even figure out in retrospect why the 74-75 recession was severe, the 88-182 recession was severe, then were followed by two mild, by a mild recession in 1991, uh, uh, and, and in 2001, uh, then, then we have the mother of all recessions. It's difficult to even account in retrospect, for the benefit of hindsight, what, why that pattern followed. Uh, why we had mild, why we had severe. So I said, but what if they, we're definitely headed for recession. And I was even wrong about that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and by the way, I hasten to say that what I've been pushing, in, uh, especially in my tweets, is that, uh, is that the, the, the strength of this expansion is much exaggerated. Uh, I'll, I want to do just get, get into a couple of little wonkish numbers. Uh, there's a measure of gross domestic product called gross domestic income. Uh, and briefly, it's, the, it, 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 it's exactly conceptually the same thing, except it measures uh, product on the income side rather than on the GDP side. Now, the GDP measure is regarded as somewhat more accurate, but, but the GDI, gross domestic income, is also published and also adds some value. There has been almost never a time when the gap between the two has been so wide. Gross domestic income measures have been showing very, very mild growth. Gross domestic product looks a heck of a lot better. And uh, the gap between the two is so wide that the truth of the matter is that the posted GDP numbers are an exaggeration. I make that point because Again, I, I'd like to bring us down to reality. We're really, we're really at a very slow, very, very mild uh, rate of growth, much milder than the recent figure of more than 4% GDP suggested. On the other hand, this is not a recession. We have all kinds of overwhelming evidence that it isn't. The other thing I point I made just recently was that uh, if you take the standard measure of average hourly earnings by all private sector workers, and you use the standard consumer price index, and then you compare the October 2023 number with the February 2020. Why did I choose February 2020? That was the month before the lockdowns, the month before they shut the economy down. So compared with February 2020, the 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 average the hourly earnings of private sector workers, according to the official numbers, have gone up by just four cents. And that's 44 months ago. And then on my chart, I show in most 44-month periods in prior years, it goes up by more than 40 cents. 
And so we really have made very, very minuscule progress in terms of wages. Why do I say that? Because Krugman and the others are saying that, 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 it's, uh, that isn't it ridiculous that people aren't cheering this wonderful economy. It's not a wonderful economy. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a very slow growth. We're just muddling through. But, uh, but we have too much evidence from employment to show that we are not in a recession. Not yet, at least. And I, I thought we would be, and I was mistaken, and I am not one of those people who wants to be right about bad news. I'm always happy about being wrong about bad news. Now, I won't mention some of the colleagues of mine who are constantly forecasting a major collapse, and, and they will probably say, well, but the more you postpone uh, the recession, the worse it's going to be. Uh, an argument can be made from that, but really, uh, based upon the numbers we have and based upon our understanding of, uh, of the severity of business cycles, we don't know that. So I'm just happy that people are doing a little better. I'm happy about the fact that there are jobs. I'm happy I was wrong and that uh, and that people are getting by. Uh, any special reaction to that, uh, Tom? Well, Gene, you and I have talked about this kind of topic before where I've said to you, I, I, I come across so many people and, and so many testimonies on social media and like the response to that quote, Oliver Anthony guy, you know, who's, who's deploring how hard people work for such low wages and that if the things are getting out of people's reach in terms of, of, of prices and whether that's housing or food or, or whatever. And, and maybe I'm, being unfair to you, and in, in which case, please correct me, but I get the okay. impression from you that, 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 well, these people just are not reading statistics correctly. But, uh, but I think there is something real there. I, I mean, people like my, my own 20-year-old daughter is not a dope, and she's saying, she's, I don't know how anybody makes it out there. Uh, just looking at the situation that they face, I don't know how anybody makes it. Is that just all anecdotal, or is there anything that's really happening here? Okay, just, <laughs> I'm not going to, I, uh, you don't know how anybody makes it. Okay. Um, I guess the question I'd ask is, uh, we can't just, I mean, do you have an anecdote, Tom? I'm not even clear. Uh, I mean, you know, do you have a killer yeah, anecdote? Yeah, I, I sure do. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I work all day. I work all day every day. Yeah. And I've, I've realized that in order for me to save up enough for a down payment, I would have to do this absolutely nonstop for 12 years and not enjoy my life at all, not do anything, not go on vacations, not eat in restaurants, not. Do... And so th the prime years of my life are now sucked into this machine. Okay. So again, I, I just want, you, you, you want, you want to point out, which I'll readily grant, because as I said, there's been barely, according to the official numbers, barely any wage progress since February of 2000. But it's not down, it's, it's somewhat up. Uh, I will, I, will uh, I guess, uh, let me invoke Thomas Sowell. You have had many shows on your, uh, many, in fact, you've had me on like two or three times, talked about Thomas Sowell, and you recently had our mutual friend, uh, uh, what the guy you you you, you know your recent show on Thomas Sowell's data now to, to, Thomas Sowell's particular and about his recent book uh, Thomas Sowell points out that that most of the numbers that are cited are statistical people and that the most valuable research that's done which he which he cites copiously is the longitudinal research now what does longitudinal mean it means that there is research that actually follows the same people through time and ask, how do people do through time? Do most of them do better than their parents? Do most of them do better in, in their 40s than in their 30s? And Thomas Sowell shows that, uh, that, uh, that, that the, for the vast majority, uh, there is indeed improvement, that people do better throughout their careers, and that to compare, you know, he made a, made a joke about, about the top 1% being this close-knit 
group, and he said, and he, uh, that was Paul Krugman, and and Saul said, if they're so close knit, uh, they certainly must have a difficult time keeping track of each other because because the one percent is a very dynamic group of people. Most people are in the one percent one year; they're not in the one percent another year. So. I'm, I'm mentioning Sowell only because you have a high regard for him, and m- most of his research is thrust in, in the other direction. That that if you if uh, well, basically the classic point is that is that a, 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 the sort of person who doesn't earn a whole lot usually finds uh, the wage plateauing in the forties. The rest of us find wage wages is plateauing in the fifties. With that said, of course, I have invaded against. The uh, the housing restrictions against restrictive license, all kinds of things that make it hard for people. But what I'm uh, what I'm what all I, I'm only invoking soul because again all I'm really saying is that uh, you just mentioned one. I mean, some person you mentioned who must be having a hard time. There are such people. But but what what, what is your punchline? Do you think that people that people are worse off today than they were four years ago? Is that what you're saying? Would you make that general statement? Well, I think they're general- making more. I think they're making more of a statement of they're worse off than the previous generation. Now, obviously, in some right. qualitative ways, there's no way to 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 uh, agree with that because they have access to things that other people wouldn't have. I mean, nobody would want to sit. I mean, nobody who's right mind wants to go back to, let's say, 1990 or something, which is a little bit farther out. I mean, unless you you want to use a Commodore 64. And and you want to have a car that may or may not have air conditioning, whatever. I mean, probably you don't want to go back to that. You want to have a world where you're interconnected. You have a, you know a range, a, a much much wider range of opportunities. I, I totally get that, but I think they're saying that it was easier to get a house then. Now, granted, the house was smaller. I mean, I know I know there are a lot of ways you can critique this argument. The house was smaller, okay. had fewer amenities, whatever. But but you don't think they've tapped into anything real at all. In saying okay, that no, you have well, to really indeed. struggle today, well, well, I, 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 I completely agree. Mortgage interest rates are over seven percent, and uh, that's a lot higher. I, I haven't looked it up, but they, they weren't in the nineties. Uh, the, the home ownership rate, by the way, is about a uh, share of households who own homes is about uh, the same as it was in the early nineties. But, um, you know, the share of households who own a home. However, it's becoming increasingly difficult for young people, for people to buy their first home. Lots of things to complain about. But, but I mean, I'm, I don't, what I'm not clear, Tom, is that I'm making a long-distance call, flying on a plane. Well, I mean, if we, if we look at aggregate numbers that just come from the government, uh, if we look at longitudinal studies about people who live their lives and whether they're better off than they were 10, 20 years ago, better off than their parents. Studies overwhelmingly cited by somebody you admire, Thomas Sowell, uh, then that none of that is true. However, uh, if you want to talk right now about what's happened to the potential to buy a home, that's definitely bad news. Uh, absolutely. So if, uh, if you want me to modify my point and say that uh, when I said that people's Wage is a little bit higher than it was uh, in February of, two th- of 2020. You want to say yes, but it's harder to f- to buy a home. Then I completely agree with you. Uh, I I don't think it's a tragedy if you rent an apartment, but that's a setback. So if you so if you want to get into nitty gritty and talk about different ways in which uh, things are better or slightly worse, I'm probably going to agree with you, but. In broad brush strokes, despite the fact that we've had, uh, again, we have all kinds of ways in which people have difficulty getting access to good jobs in high in, in high wage areas because of the housing problem the government has created. Uh, despite all those facts, everybody is doing better across the board on all wage levels than 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and and then I don't know you just sort of conceded when you when you broke it apart. You know, the, the, do you have air conditioning in your car? Do you have a car that lasts? Do you, uh, how long? If you own a home, how large is it? Uh, can you fly on a plane? Can, can you get in touch with, with a relative in Ireland? Uh, 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 
the most things are better. So, so I'm not even clear where we're disagreeing. I, I was, uh, uh, I, I, I was only saying that uh, in in this particular case, we didn't have a recession. And my particular, just to get back to put a fine, putting a fine point on it, I do think it's unfortunate that we've got some pretty well informed colleagues in the Austrian tradition who are stop clocks, they're constantly predicting disaster is going to happen next year, the year thereafter, eventually they're going to be right. I was wrong in even predicting that there was going to be a recession. So uh, so we're, so that I don't see that there's a lot of daylight between us, as they like to say. Yes, it's harder to buy a house right now, absolutely. So so that's true, and I, maybe I should have added that. And I also mentioned, as I say, that 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 the that the cheerleaders for the Biden uh, economy uh, are missing out on the facts that I've cited uh, uh, that the inflation is still really hitting the wage. They're only four cents ahead of where they were in uh, in February, and indeed as well that that if you look at gross domestic income, growth is really rather tepid. We are sort of in a side state of stagflation still. So that's my punchline, and I don't see that you and I disagree that strongly, Tom, uh, in in what we just said, especially since you're a fan of Thomas Sowell and you just celebrated his recent book. I I would. I still feel like there are going to be people in the comments saying, Gene Epstein just doesn't get it. That, that's, oh. And so I'm, I'm, I'm here as the representative of those people to, to um, give them an opportunity to be heard. But, that, but Gene, look, look, this is, look, we're already way, way over. And, and, and okay. so what we need to do is, is take the other things you're thankful for and do them as a lightning round. And what I'm sorry? Because you prepped things on these cards. And if you have other things that you're thankful for, we should do it oh, yeah, as mean. a lightning round. Oh, a lightning round. Okay, I don't. I don't actually. Uh, there's there's nothing really major. Uh, l- 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 let me let me end on a lighter note. On a lighter note, and say that um, uh, uh, that that relates a little bit to this idea. I don't get it. That that I, I I'm really thankful for live streaming. I I think that as I've said uh, many times in my heavy handed way. That if Shakespeare were alive in Dickens' day, he'd be writing novels. If Dickens were alive in Shakespeare's day, he'd be writing plays. If Dickens and Shakespeare were alive today, they'd be developing a, a long-form shows for uh, for HBO and Showtime and the rest. And there's been a, a, a recent show called The Bear. Have you heard of that, Thomas? Seen it? it it's, I it's have a, not. It's, it's a two-part series about a restaurant about. Uh, about and uh, and and it's a delightful uh, story about this group of people and this guy takes over the restaurant. His 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 brothers committed suicide. Ran the restaurant. He's a very good chef. He takes over the restaurant and uh, and and he tries to whip it into shape. It it's a it's an absolute wonderful pain to to capitalism uh, and to the devotion that people have to the uh, to the restaurant business. And it's a very moving. A show about the interaction of human beings, and and we, we are living in a renaissance. You have been a huge fan of shows like Breaking Bad. Uh, we we are, we we have been lucky enough to live to be living through a re, a period of a great flowering of talent that that has put on these long form shows and shown how what TV can do, how it can get marrow deep into character that 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 I think really is the major art form of our time that corresponds to the novels that Dickens wrote and Balzac wrote and correspond to the plays that Shakespeare wrote. So it's our, it's our answer to art. And I think it's a huge, of course, obviously, the ability, of course, to make it possible for us to watch it at our own convenience. Another big thing that's happened, we couldn't do that in the early 90s, although I, I had a VCR and I did it a little bit. But, the, but, but, but I'm, I'm very thankful for that part of my life because indeed uh, it has greatly enhanced uh, my aesthetic life. Much as I'm in love with live theater, just as you are, and and actually I, I have a huge screen in my home and I watch movies there, but I, I actually scored the, saw the recent Scorsese movie in a large theater and I thought it was pretty good, so I do go to movies as well. Uh, there, there's, there's always room for new art forms. Live theater will never die, but I'm thankful for this new art form that is so enriched 
my life and I think enriched yours as well. So maybe we, we ought to conclude on that time because I had a, a, a bunch of minor thank yous otherwise. And, and well, especially since a lot of people think I'm out of it with, with respect to how people are doing in the economy, let's end on that note and maybe we can discuss that another day. Well, how about this? Oh, uh, oh Tom. Oh, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, Tom. No, Tom. Look, the final note is that is that I will have turned 79 on November 19th. I was born in 1944. And, oh. and am I doing fine at 79? Well, I'm doing not so fine. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm suffering from something that's very been called dystonia, runs with estonia. And it's the kind of, and it, uh, by the way, uh, most famously, RFK Jr. has dystonia of the vocal cords. It's called dysphonia. It's uh, in his case dystonia. It's it's a trembling of the muscles uh, that is very distracting. That causes dizziness. I'm feeling it now. But when I do my soul forms, when I do my interviews with you, uh, uh, the uh, the adrenaline flows, and I feel a certain sense of relief, even though I still feel it. So, uh, and and when I think of all my other friends who were 79 who didn't quite make it. I, when I think of people who have all kinds of other problems, I am thankful that I'm doing relatively fine at 79. Well, we all feel that way, Gene. And I, I'd like to conclude with something that isn't so much a note of thankfulness as much as it is an invitation. And I realize okay. it, 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 I'm putting you on the spot by in, inviting you to this here on the show instead of asking yeah. you privately. But Uh, Yesterday, in my email newsletter and on my Twitter and my personal Facebook, I revealed a little something that I think is quite interesting. Uh, A few months ago, a couple months ago, at my home here in in Central Florida, I held a murder mystery dinner party. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And and the theme was 1920s Chicago gangster mafia prohibition era uh, theme. And... It was, a, it was an amazing night. Everybody was in costume. Um, people had been assigned their characters well in advance. They knew all about their characters. They had costume recommendations. We decorated the house uh, beautifully. We had silent movies playing on the TV. We had 1920s jazz through the sound system in the house. We really, and we had a professional yeah. chef preparing a plated meal for all 20 guests. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was it was an experience, I'm telling you. And everybody absolutely went berserk for it. So I decided, look, I travel a lot. Why not do one of these dinners in some of the cities I'm going to be traveling to anyway? Um, and so I've got, so I have a website, woodsmystery.com, where I have a list of the cities where I'll be holding one of these um, murder mystery dinner parties. And they're, they're just oh. great, but nobody else is doing Who else is doing anything like this, Gene? You know, so I like to be, <laughs> The only guy doing whatever the thing is, right? No, only nobody else in our world that. is putting on murder mystery dinner parties, you know? So, <laughs> but we are doing one because you know we get to New York a lot. So we figured, oh. why not do one in New York? So we have one scheduled for New York for the end of September. And basically what it consists of is you get a little information about your character. Then the night of the party, over the course of the evening, you get several printed briefings that tell you things you ought to talk about with, uh, with particular other characters and other information you need to push the story along. After the mm-hmm. dinner, somebody is revealed to be the victim, and we all kind of put our heads together to try to figure out who done it. Mm-hmm. And the murderer himself does not know he's the murderer until at the very end when the final reveal uh, occurs. So what mm-hmm. I'm asking, Gene, is mm-hmm. I know you just turned 79, and you will be on the verge of 80 when this event <laughs> happens, but will you be part of my murder mystery dinner party in New York City? Absolutely, Tom. And I, I, I'm. Uh, have you have you named the particular day? Because you know I do a soul form every day of the month. Uh, each month I do. It. So do you know the day? Oh, you don't know. September. Offhand. I just checked it. September twenty eighth, twenty twenty four. I think it's a Saturday. September eighth on a Saturday. September twenty eighth, twenty eighth. So right at the end of the month. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, I never have soul forms on a Saturday. September 20th, it's on my calendar, and it's going to be in New York, so probably on the island of Manhattan, right? So, uh, so Yes, it will. I, I can't remember if I've identified the hotel or not, but I've stayed in some beautiful hotels. And the way we do it is I don't rent out a ballroom because there will only be about 25 of us uh, for this to work. I well, just uh, rent um, can, a huge— can I, can, I, can, I, can I bring my wife? 
Oh, if 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 Hisako would like to be part of it, she's absolutely welcome. Yeah. We'll assign her a character I think, also. Uh, I, I, I just get a it. large, like the presidential suite or something like that with a big dining table and, uh, you know, and a beautiful view of the city. I do stuff like that. Uh, and it's, it's fun. It's, it's, it's a great time. So, well, uh, so this uh, is great. So uh, true. Go ahead. Yes. Unequivocally, Tom. I mean, All I right. thought, I thought you, I thought, look, you, you're a jet setter. I mean, you know, if this is Tuesday, Tom is in Chicago, I know, or in London or wherever else. And at one point, Point. You said you were actually going to do a pied a terre in New York City, and then you, then you said, "No, no, I travel so much. I, I'm I'm just going to do hotels in New York City." But look, yeah, you I almost got an apartment. Yeah, yeah, you were on the first. In fact, in fact, I, I said, "Would you like an apartment in my wife's building?" And you said, "No." You actually wrote, "I don't want to live that far downtown, Tom. I want to live near anyway." And you said you, to me. Gene, I want to live near the theater district. We actually got down to that particular nitty gritty. But anyway, if it's in my backyard, Tom, well, in Manhattan, of course I want to come. And thank you so much for the invitation. I All right. So everybody else, look, I'll, 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 well, especially yes. you New Yorkers. Yes. You will be able to interact with Gene Epstein himself, who we don't know what his name in the at the dinner will be. Okay. But you'll be able to interact with Gene himself and me at the New York one. But you'll get to see, you check out all the cities where we're going to do this at woodsmystery.com. And the earlier you sign up for these, the better, because I, I do need you to have some time to know who your character is and stuff like that. You don't want to sign up the night before this thing. It just doesn't work. So, At 79, I'm a slow learner, Tom, so I'm a little, little bit of time. Glad. I'll give you ample opportunity, <laughs> Gene, to get informed about it. So the, the website for it, again, is woodsmystery.com, and it's, it's I'll a whole lot of down. Well, Gene, happy Thanksgiving yeah. to you. Yes. A and, uh, and, and, you know, I... I was just saying today to somebody that, you know, I'm having Gene Epstein on for Thanksgiving. How can I not end by saying, Gene, I am deeply thankful for you and the work you've done and continue to do. Well, I was about to say uh, as, as well, uh, just, but we ran out of time. That, of course, I'm thankful for all the friendships I've made by being part of the Liberty Movement. And you have become one of those valued friends uh, and uh, and and that that of course is the source uh, a major source of happiness for us all friendship and uh, and I'm especially thankful for that uh, and yeah uh, let's talk briefly Tom once we sign off I just wanted to confirm a couple of things will you okay we'll do yeah. so thank you Gene Epstein and thank you ladies and gentlemen and happy Thanksgiving. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.